Welcome to the Awesomers.com podcast. If you love to learn, and if you're motivated to expand your mind, and heck, if you desire to break through those traditional paradigms and find your own version of success, you are in the right place. Awesomers around the world are on a journey to improve their lives and the lives of those around them. We believe in paying it forward, and we fundamentally try to live up to the great Zig Ziglar quote, where he said, you can have everything in your life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It doesn't matter where you came from, it only matters where you're going. My name is Steve Simonson, and I hope you will join me on this awesomer journey. If you're launching a new product manufactured in China, you will need professional, high-resolution, Amazon-ready photographs. Because Simo Global has a team of professionals in China, you will oftentimes receive your listings photographs before your product even leaves the country. This streamlined process will save you the time, money, and energy needed to concentrate on marketing and other creative content strategies before your item is in stock and ready for sale. Visit simoglobal.com to learn more, because a picture should be worth 1,000 keywords. You are listening to episode number 118 on the Awesomers.com podcast series. And the tradition is now pretty well known. Just go to Awesomers.com slash 118 to find today's show notes, relevant details, and uh, maybe even a transcript. So today is part one in a special three-part series with uh, a very brilliant entrepreneur, David Paul Doyle. Now, David Paul started off even as a kid knowing kind of what he wanted to do. He decided really from a young age, he wanted to become a fighter pilot. And he studied and, and kind of talks about that story in his, uh, today in his origin beginnings, went on to the Air Force Academy and so forth until he had an epiphany. And really, you know, uh, kind of took a, a different path than, than he had expected or prepared for, for the prior decade or more as a young person. So I really, uh, I've always appreciated uh, hanging out with uh, David Paul getting to know him. He's an exceptionally talented entrepreneur, but also a a person who's very in touch with, you know, both sides of the equation, right? The right side of the brain and the left side, and somebody who has just a tremendous amount of wisdom. Let's go ahead and jump into today's episode right now. Hey, Awesomers, it's me, Steve Simpson. We're back again with another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast. And today I have my very special guest, David Paul Doyle. How are you doing, David Paul? Hi everybody. Good to see you. Well, it's uh, it's thrilled. Uh, it's thrilling for me to have you on the show because we've been uh, bouncing around in similar groups of masterminds in the past year or so, and and I I've loved uh, you know hearing your story and learning about your business. It's really a cool thing, um, and, and I've already read in your bio and and some of the background information for the Osmers out there listening, but maybe just to start out with, tell us where you live today and what takes up your time day to day as well. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I live here in Ashland, Oregon. Um, my family's been here for about 15 years now. We, we migrated up from the Bay Area. I was in high tech uh, before we moved up here into Ashland. And um, boy, you know, I would say it's never, it's never a dull moment being a CEO. Uh, I would say that my, I can't, my, there's no rhyme or reason to my days. Honestly, it's depending on whatever issues are happening in the moment, whether it's dealing with fires, you know, with Amazon, whether it's fulfillment issues, whether it's employee issues, morale, culture, um, I'm a sales guy. I mean, I'm just kind of have my fingers in everything. So it's, really whatever demands my attention the most. Oftentimes I'll have meetings all day long and other times I have nothing booked. So it's truly random. Um, just dealing with whatever seems to be the most pressing thing in the moment. Um, and honestly, it's, it's all over the board, traveling to and going to workshops and lectures or whatever it is, you know, yeah. dealing with paperwork. It just, you know. Oh, well, geez, we had all the great talk about the travel and the CEO and putting out fires. And then we got into paperwork. Boy, it's just a real buzzkill there, David Paul. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the, listen, the reality is I think a lot of awesomers and CEOs out there can, can relate that, you know, it's, it literally can be, you know, chaotic at times and other times, you know, very uh, peaceful and you just kind of never know what you're going to get. Uh, in many ways, I've always thought that the CEO's job is, you know, besides the strategic planning and so forth, to be able to help the organization uh, prepare to fight those fires, right? And do you find that to be a similar thing, you know, as a responsibility for a CEO, you have to 
help that organization develop the skills so they can fight the fires? Yeah, and I certainly have tried really hard to do that. Oftentimes, um, so I, I, boy, our organizational size has drifted over the years. It's been up, it's come down, it's been up, it's come down, just depending upon the needs. And I would say that, yeah, my job is to prepare them to have the knowledge, the background, the attitude to be a fighter and to go deal with those, those issues, you know, to develop that level of savviness and, or resourcefulness to go figure it out without my involvement. You know, being in the company the longest of, out of anyone, I tend to carry certain kinds of knowledge that can be helpful or insights that can be helpful that I tend to you know, Amazon and it just, you know, we obviously we have a supplements company and there's complexities that just nobody can pick up, you know, in two months, six months, nine months. It just takes time to have seen every type of forest fire out there to know how to address it or what it is. So I tend to still be a resource for people, even though the longer they're here, the more they can fight those fires on their own. And obviously it's great just to have you know, a really capable team to be able to go figure it out on their own. Even if it takes them a little bit more time, I don't have to be involved. But, you know, when you have attrition or people leave or some of your best people have learned so much, they're like, oh, I'm going to go leave and start my own company. Or, you know, I've really had some of my best, best people uh, that are so entrepreneurial and savvy go start their own companies. And, you know, I'm still friends with them and everything like that. But, you know, sometimes there's brain drains that happen. And uh, I don't know. I would say yes and no, you know, it's hard to always have stability. I think when you're in a pretty unstable environment, um, especially, you know, Amazon, I, I consider it very unstable business model. Um, it it's just so competitive, so dynamic, so ever changing. And it's not always easy to just have this, you know, it's not like old school st stable businesses, right? Yeah, it is very different and it's quite dynamic. Uh, I, I think it is that, that yin and yang problem of, you know, where we have a lot of knowledge. And by the way, most uh, entrepreneurs are kind of born firefighters. In fact, we find our comfort zone in fighting the fires. And we feel like John Wayne, you know, bang, bang, bang. I'm, I'm shooting all these, uh, you know, uh, fires out as, as we go. Uh, the reality, though, is over time, ideally, and you talked about brain drain, we'll probably come back to that. You know, if your team or your systems are set up to, to prevent some of those fires to begin with, right, which is uh, a big part of uh, uh, forest fires is the prevention. Uh, and then it's inevitable, though, that those problems will come up. I still think that the fact that our businesses exist is because problems exist, right? If, if anybody else could just do it without problems, they would. <laughs> and, and so one of our, our advantages is that we can respond to problems and deal with them. Yeah, I was, I, I come so agree with you. And what's interesting is, you know, I didn't know what you're going to ask me today. And I'm sure we're going to talk about lots of cool, cool topics. But one of the things, when I think about what may, has made us successful all these years, it's resourcefulness and it's the ability to survive, right? The constant ability to just persevere after problem, after problem, after problem. And really, even if you feel like you just got the crap beat out of you, by whatever situation you're in or a competitor or someone like that, just to keep picking yourself back up and just keep going, no matter how, how many times you get knocked down. And really, you know, I think it's that, that spirit of what you're talking about of just your, you know, the, the ability to just keep going and problem solve after problem solve. And that, you know, really, I think in the long run, you know, cause I'm going on seven years now, it's the thing that uh, not giving up, is really where the long-term success is, no matter, because I think we're all, I don't know a single person who isn't constantly doing that in this particular business. And those who survive are the ones who just, no matter how bad a situation might seem, to just know that somehow you're gonna get through it and to get to the other side and you're gonna look back and go, that wasn't too bad, or that was bad, but you know what? I, I'm a survivor and it's, we're, we're moving forward. Well, and again, it's all relative, isn't it, right? You know, we could all be in, in one large ditch digging it out and, and shoveling and the guy next to us getting dirt on us and we could complain about that for the next 20 years or we could, we've got the, the, the aptitude and the luck to be in the businesses we're in to be able to solve these problems. You know, Great. fundamentally, our opportunities are, are pretty exceptional uh, when you're selling online in whatever way you're doing it. 
And, and so that, that's a big deal. And I, I definitely echo your, your sentiments there that, you know, all of us have to have to deal with these things. And, and, but I'll tell you, everybody has this general feeling, or at least many of the people out there, especially the uninitiated, this feeling that, you know, the other guys always have it easier. That, you know, the guys across the street, or the other side of the grass, whatever it is, they always have it easier. And the answer is no, nobody's got it easy. It's all just problem solving. We're all in the same kind of business. And it's just, you're, you know, you pointed out this reinforcement of just get back up and go again. Just get back up and go again. It's not easy when you, especially when you're freshly kicked in the, you know, the, the stomach, it is not easy to catch your breath and get back in the fight. But what choice do we have, right? I mean, we can go retire and, and uh, get a cubicle job or a ditch digging job, but I'd rather uh, stay in the fight. What, what's your thoughts, David? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think deep down inside, I just am a fighter. You know, I've always been a competitor. And competitors, you just, I don't know. You know I, I was just very into sports all growing up and, you know, have that kind of competitive attitude. And I think that, um, and, you know, it's interesting. I've, this is like my probably my third career I've had completely unrelated to my previous careers. And I find that the longer I've been in it, the more I go, you know what, I don't, doesn't really matter how bad it looks. I have a history. Like I finally can rely on the fact that I will get through it. Like there's never, I don't have to go, boy, am I going to get through this one? It's like, you know what, no matter how bad it seems, I'm always going to keep, I know that the end result will be okay. And it's taken me though a long time to really have that level of faith that no matter what's going on, somehow it's all going to work out. I and, love it. Uh, well, that, that's experience and perspective that, you know, and actually some confidence in there too, by the way, because I know plenty of people who've been doing this, uh, you know, a long time that they will still question, you know, that. And so I think it is a, a very, um, I don't know if the right word is peaceful place to be, but it's a, it's a good thing to recognize, you know what, I've been through stuff. I'll get through this too. Every solution has a problem. Uh, it's mature and it's uh, very smart uh, for you to have that. So David, Paul, one of the things I like to do on origin stories, I like to fly back to the very beginning. And so let's do that right now. And uh, tell me uh, where you were born, if you will. Sure. I was born in Los Gatos, California, which is a, a little tiny town, uh, like maybe 25, 30,000 people. But within Silicon Valley, there's so many cities in Silicon Valley. I mean, there could be, 50, you know, could, I don't know, 20, 25, 30. They're all kind of jammed together. But this one is right up against the edge of the mountains, the last town before you head over the hill of Santa Cruz. Now, Los so. Gatos, does that mean the fish? No, no. The, the cats. cats. The cats, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. my uh, high school Spanish paying off, everybody. I got it on my <laughs> second guess. <laughs> uh, and, and actually with a little help from David Paul. So how about your parents? What, what did they do um, at, during the time you were born and the time you were growing up? Were they entrepreneurial, have some other kind of uh, vocation? You know, my dad was a businessman. I guess I would call him entrepreneurial. I didn't really think of him much of an, as an entrepreneur. He grew up, my dad was born in San Francisco, my mom in Burlingame, so we're all from the Bay Area. They were born and raised in the Bay Area, and my dad went to San Jose State, which is a small college right there in San Jose, and um, he, right out of college, he was an insurance salesman, and he did that his entire career. He was one of those people that just did one thing, but you know, he was uh, charismatic, and he was that handshaking kind of guy. He went in, you know, into people's living rooms, you know, and sat down on the couch and he was very old school. Unfortunately, he never transitioned into the internet age. He just didn't, he was just quite a little bit the wrong generation. And um, so, but he did life insurance his whole career and he did really good. I mean, for a life insurance salesman, he was crushing it for a good number of years. Um, I, I am estimating he was probably doing 500K a year back in the 70s you know, like really yeah. doing well for himself. And so he moved us up into the mountains um, above Silicon Valley. We had, you know, I kind of grew up, I was really lucky. I grew up in the valley until I was about fifth grade. And then we moved up into the mountains. We had 14 acres and a really nice house overlooking all of Silicon Valley and Monterey Bay. Really beautiful. Oh, so I was kind of a mountain kid, you know, grew up just riding motorcycles and, you know, um, all the way through high school, really. I had to commute you know, drive about 30 minutes down through the mountains into Los Gatos to go to high school and whatnot. So, uh, but I really love live grow, growing up in the, in the woods. You know, yeah, that's great. a beautiful area. I actually, as a kid, um, I'm not sure the ages, but probably somewhere in the 
the seven to ten range, I lived in Monterey. Uh, actually, oh, okay. the Army Base Fort Ord. So, oh, my dad uh, went to Fort Ord when, uh, like, uh, yeah, back in whatever kind of late Vietnam era. Yeah, yeah. So my my dad was in the Army uh, post Vietnam, um, right after Vietnam ended, and we ended up stationed there in Fort Ord as well. So it's a small world after all, as they say. Yeah, that's so, funny. Yeah. Uh, how about your mom? What, did she uh, stay home, take care of the kids? Did she have a uh, job she as well? Was a, yeah, she was. Uh, she worked up until we were born, and um, but then she was just a, a mom, you know, full time mom all those years. Great mom, took us to every sporting event and uh, you know event we could go to. And uh, yeah, she was great. Tough job yeah. in its own right, that's for sure. How about any siblings? I heard you say they a few times, so. Uh, I had one sister okay. um, and uh, she was kind of the bla black sheep of the family, so. Uh, <laughs> All right, how about that? Yeah, yeah she, was, she was the opposite of me in every way possible. Meaning you're good. Uh -huh. That's right, I, mean, I, I, was the, I was the good kid. Yeah, yeah. She was, the, she was the rebel rouser. Well, this is uh, this is what they say when you're on your uh, the podcast. You can make your own history, everybody. You can write it. <laughs> That's right. You guys don't even know if what I'm saying is true. Right? That's right. So, uh, how about university, uh, David Paul? Did you uh, go uh, to any university? Yeah, you know. So, I was uh, when I was like in seventh, eighth grade was when the uh, um, space shuttle was really happening, and I was really decided I wanted to become an astronaut. I know it sounds crazy. Every kid who, you know, so many kids wanted to be astronauts, but I really wanted to. And I ended up writing a letter, physical letter to John Glenn, sent it to him. And I actually got a reply and I said, hey, where should I go to college to become an astronaut? And he wrote me back and said, you should go to the Air Force Academy. And so from the eighth grade on, I was pretty hell bent on going to the academy. I went to the library and got a, you know, a, what's it called? A, just a book and, you know, all about the Academy. <laughs> I like this. This is like a little history lesson for millennials out there. I went to the library. This is the place <laughs> yeah. they keep books. Yeah. Keep going. David and and I, well, I just read like, what are the, how do you get in there? And I just kind of set myself up on a trajectory to go there. And, and I ended up, you know, worked my butt off in high school and went to the Air Force Academy right out of high school to become a pilot and, um, you know, kind, to kind of pursue that dream. And so that's what I did. I went to the academy out of high school and, you know, I really loved it there. Um, I, I, I was a soaring instructor while I was there and just really loved every moment of being there, except I, I, it was at the height of the Cold War. So this is 89. I was studying Russian at the time at the academy. I took a couple of years of Russian and I was an international relations major there. And I decided to go, you could actually leave for one year before your commitment. So in all the military academies, you sign your commitment, your papers, that you're locked into the academy or locked into the military the first day of your junior year. So after my sophomore year, they had this program where you could take off one year and then come back and sign your commitment. And so I took off and I went and studied in Moscow for nine months. I lived at a university. I worked in the embassy for a few months. And... I loved, I mean, I was loving it over there. Was, oh, the, the Berlin Wall came down while I was over there. So wow. it was a su super exciting time to be over there. So it's like the last vestiges of communism, you know, and, um, but something unexpected happened to me that, uh, I don't know, this isn't really the, the point of this business, but I'll tell you briefly, I was, I had two other buddies, two other academy buddies were with me at the time. And Long story short, we were riding in this car only two weeks away from going back to the academy. And so, and I never once, the whole time, thought of leaving the academy. I just loved what I was, you know, what I wanted to become. But I was sitting in the back seat of this car, and literally out of nowhere, this huge wave of love came over me. And I can't really describe it any other than that. It was like I just felt a fit. It was like a, literally like a wave hit me. And I had this really, life-changing moment that this this voice was really clear in my head and just said hey if you were an old man on your deathbed what would you have done in your life to have had absolutely no regrets and this was like a really i mean very clear moment completely unexpected never even remotely thought anything like this and i just in my mind in that moment i i just had this knowingness wash over me that it had nothing to do with being a pilot in the military like nothing and then i it was just an instantaneous knowingness and then i i asked i said well what would i have done to have had no regrets 
And I just, honestly, this is kind of picture in my mind came to me of this, all this light just going out everywhere. And these words came that said I would write books that impacted people's lives around the world. And it just washed over me. And I just knew in that moment I was never going back to the academy. Like it all happened in probably one second, you know, two seconds. I have no idea. It just happened. Didn't anticipate it. So in that moment, I literally like turned to my friends. I'm like, holy shit, you guys. You never believe what just happened to me. Because like I was a different person two seconds later. And we had this long talk in the car. And my one buddy, one of the buddies ended up going back to the academy and he became an F-15 pilot. And my other buddy in the car, he also, after this conversation, got him thinking and he left and he never went back. And he ended up going to University of Chicago and ended up, he, he, now he's in charge. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago for my birthday. We've stayed friends. And um, he's now, in, he's been in charge of the antenna on the iPhone for the past 10 years. He's been at Apple for 10 years and he oversees 25 project managers that are in charge of the iPhone antenna. So that's kind of what he does. Wow. And, um, that's and a lot of people over an antenna. Yeah, I know. Big, big part of the functioning of a phone, right? I guess. Oh, I guess I should say all wireless. It's yeah. all the wireless connectivity for the phone. Amazing. So, so, so I, yeah. I, so anyway, I ended up leaving the Academy and went, finished up my time at UC Berkeley. So, you know, from the Bay area and, um, so that's kind of a long story to where I went to college, but two years at the academy, and then I finished up two years at UC Berkeley. No, I like that. Uh, I'm particularly interested in that that kind of epiphany that you had. Um, even to this day, it doesn't sound like you have any causational uh, theories. Like, it was just well, random? or uh, Yeah, it was just random. I really feel like, you know, I don't know what people's belief systems are, but, you know, whatever my my higher self my soul i don't know what 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 that was but to this moment but you know exactly but i just think it was i was on the wrong path like you know i feel like i came here for a purpose and that wasn't it you know i think that was the purpose of a, a seven year you know seventh grade eighth grade young man but i think in the long run it wasn't really what i was here to do and so just, just to say that I did end up going on to becoming an author, my wife and I ended up writing books for 10 years. So um, just to lead into it, um, after I finished Berkeley, my wife and I met and, um, you know, we kind of got onto a, a spiritual path and long story short, we ended up writing books on meditation and emotional mental healing. And we taught that for over 10 years. Um, and really love that. I mean, that really does feel like one of the proudest things I've ever accomplished this lifetime. I feel really great about that work. You know, we put our heart and soul into writing books and teaching people those skills that are still super important to me today. Personally, I don't, I don't teach that anymore. That career kind of ended when um, I started NatureWise. But, um, you know, it's near and dear to my heart and I couldn't feel more grateful. And I do feel like if my life ended today, and this is true, if my life ended today, I would have accomplished my life's purpose. And it really was to do that work with my wife. It was, you know, that and having a, our daughter are the two things I feel most proud of that I've, in my accomplishments in life. So I, feel, I do feel like that put me on the right path. And I ended up discovering what that path was. I had no idea at the time what the hell I was gonna be writing about. You know, it took probably seven or eight years later before it kind of coalesced into to what we ended up doing. But um, yeah, I definitely just some part of me was put, putting me on the right path. I love it. Well, I, you know, it's uh, that uh, sixth sense, inner voice, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and again, everybody has their own belief systems. They can put their own spin on it. But yeah. the reality is it got you, that was a clear defining moment that put you on this path that you are on today and, and you know, subsequent to that time for sure. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to dive in more to the uh, the conversation about the the book and and all the things that you and your your at the time new wife uh, got into because you know, a lot of entrepreneurs talk about how important meditation is to them, but uh, the other guys who it's maybe not as important to they don't know how to do it. They it sounds too mystical, it sounds too mysterious in many ways. So uh, I'd love to have you shed some light on that when we come back right after this break. Empower. The name says it all. Connecting e-commerce entrepreneurs with great people, ideas, systems, and the services needed to stay business dynamic and to grow. Empowery is a network 
a cooperative venture of tools and resources to make you better at what you do. Because we love what you do. We are you. Visit Empowery.com to learn more. So that is part one of our three-part series. Join us tomorrow when we go on ahead and carry on further into David Paul's story. Uh, but I, I just like to take a minute to express my gratitude for David Paul, you know, t- not just taking the time, but sharing so freely and, you know, helping us all understand that everybody's journey is different. And, you know, through adversity and, you know, kind of pivoting and, and all the little variations that go along with it, there's so much to it. Uh, you're not going to want to miss uh, our next two episodes. They're packed full of uh, wonderful advice and excellent life lessons. Uh, so don't forget to join us. This has, again, been part one of a three-part series. And it's also episode number 118 of the Awesomers podcast series. Just go to awesomers.com slash 118 to, t- to see today's show notes and details. Well, we've done it again, everybody. We have another episode of the Awesomers podcast ready for the world. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that you've enjoyed our program today. Now's a good time to take a moment to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Heck, you could even leave a a review if you wanted. Awesomers around you will appreciate your help. It's only with your participation and sharing that we'll be able to achieve our goals. Our success is literally in your hands. Thank you again for joining us. We are at your service. Find out more about me, Steve Simonson, our guest, team, and all the other Awesomers involved at awesomers.com. Thank you again. Awesomers.com.